Thank you for joining us today to talk about the hybrid classroom. My name is Jackson Root, Marketing Manager here at D10. And joining me this morning is Jeffrey Backus, our Head of Sales at D10, and Jason Coggins, our Sales Lead for EDU. Also joining us this morning is Ben Grande, Head of State, Local, Government, and Education at Zoom. Our guest speakers today, our guest panelists, are Paul Hieronymus, Director of IT at North Ridgeville City Schools in Ohio, and Mitch Salerno, Head of School at Monte Vista Christian School. We'll kick off today's agenda with a brief overview of D10 and Zoom, talk a little bit about the relationship between our two brands, followed by our discussion, which will serve as the bulk of today's webinar. We'll follow up the discussion with a raffle. Make sure you stick around after the discussion for a chance to win the new Zoom for Home D10 Me. And with any time left over, we'll dig into Q&A. Since 2017, D10 and Zoom have partnered to jointly develop and co-engineer plug-and-play video collaboration products. D10 solutions are developed with Zoom to provide the best experience possible for users, such as educators and students, and IT professionals and administrators. We take care not just in the use of our products, but we also take careful consideration of the deployment and support of our products. I think at this point, most people know about Zoom and what Zoom does, but many of you out there may be unfamiliar with D10 and what we do. D10 is one of the fastest growing technology companies in the world. With products designed for personal use through deployment in large rooms, D10 solutions are designed to be simple to use, interactive, and powerful while providing easy one button to start Zoom meetings. We like to use the word simple because it really is. Simple to buy, simple to deploy, to set up, and extremely simple to use. Literally plug it in and it just works. D10 is trusted by some of the top schools in the country, including Harvard, NYU, USC and many K-12 institutions, such as Princeton Day School. And of course, our guest today, North Ridgeville City Schools in Ohio and Monte Vista Christian in California. So let's go ahead and get started with our discussion for today. To properly set the stage, our panelists are diverse in terms of location from Ohio and California, from both public and private schools. One of the things that became very apparent to us was that there's a concern for our parents um, about you know, their concerns range from what's it going to be like to, you know, for lunchroom, what's it going to be like for daily instruction, what's it going to be like for riding the bus to get to school. So all those things were huge pieces to us that made us have to really evaluate what we were doing. Uh, so for us, using that polling data, we then immediately knew that we needed to have an online option for our students totally. And we had to do that because if we don't, they're all gonna to go to Mitch's school. Uh, so we gotta really be careful that we are uh, being able to provide a, a, a resource for our, for our students. Now, we also have a, pop, a large population that wants to come to school. I mean, actually we want them all to come to school, but we got a, a population that needs our students to still come to school. So one of the uh, things that we're going to be doing is running a hybrid. And so we're very fortunate in our class, in our school buildings, we have two of them that have walls that are collapsible. So we're able to take those classrooms and what would normally be two rooms, make them into one classroom so that we can be able to provide the social distancing required for the barriers to be in place. And that's really what it's all about. It's all about barriers. The six foot distance is a barrier. My mask is a barrier. The student's mask is a barrier. And any way we can kind of make those things happen to create a safe environment for our, for our students, we need to do that. So we pull that into place, but now we have to then figure out how on earth are we gonna be able to deliver instruction to our students. Some will be full online, some will be on site. Though some of our classes, unfortunately, are not going to have enough students in both to be able to have a teacher teach one or the other. So there will be a, some situations where we'll have to do a simultaneous scenario where some of the students are in the classroom, some of the students are remote. There again is where the D10 is going to become a huge piece for us, where the classroom teacher can be able to treat that board as it's their white sp whiteboard space, use annotation, deliver content, but then most importantly with the auto framing, be able to be mobile 
and not have to worry, are they in picture, are they out of picture, are they able to you know, work, with, are they showing the right content? All of those are critical pieces for our teachers. And what makes D10 so powerful is it becomes just a natural piece for the classroom teacher to be able to just deliver content. And that's what's critical because if they're relaxed, they become better teachers. And that's so important for them. Thank yeah, you. that's a great point. That that speaks to the simplicity of, of the instruction. And as as you well know, and everybody here, you you know you've got probably a lot of uh, you know a lot of different skill level when it comes to you know your typical brick and mortar type environment and how they how your teachers instruct and what they're comfortable with or used to. And then now, not only are we just you know trying to evolve our you know uh, ability to provide several different type of uh, instructional you know, uh, classes or, you know, delivery methods for students that either can't be in class for whatever reason, and this is either prior to COVID or now post. Uh, and so, yeah, it certainly speaks to the simplicity and the ease of use for those that may be very well advanced in technology in terms of distance learning and those that are just really trying to, uh, you know, become familiar and, and use it now because we're mandated or forced to use some of the tech. But uh, so, yeah, Mitch, same question for you. You know, what, uh, you know, how is your school preparing for the upcoming school year? And then in addition to, you know, kind of what considerations and guidelines did you take and use to come up with your back to school strategy? Well, thank you. And it's good to be here with all of you. It's fun to see people from around the world watching the comments come in. And so here in California, um, we were on a track um, for fully hybrid, much like Paul, um, trying to, um, we have a four tier plan, four levels um, from fully normal to what we would call pre-COVID to level four, which is fully remote. And um, if you've been watching the news here in the U.S., you know that there was a, a pivot by our governor last week um, for, for states. We have a watch list here in the state of California and for counties that are on the watch list, which our county is on the edge of the watch list, um, needed to begin to prepare for not just hybrid, but fully remote. And so we now are in um, a second pivot um, to begin to think about how to utilize the D10 boards um, along with Zoom with our faculty in a fully rem remote scenario. One of the things that I think is part of our planning and one of the reasons that we really initially like the D10 board is it, it's both um, excellent, we believe, for hybrid, as Paul has already mentioned, but also for fully remote. And I'm certain in the conversation we'll talk a little bit more about why we think it's good for, for fully remote. Um, but where we're headed now, and I, I did check the participant list, there's a few of my teachers that are on this call, so they're going to get a bit of inside information because we're releasing an announcement within the next couple of hours that, uh, that uh, level four more than likely is, is in our future here in Santa Cruz County, the Bay Area. Um, so we're, we're preparing for fully hybrid. I'm sorry, fully, fully remote. Yeah, it's, 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 it's one thing to try to be prepared when you know specifically how you're going to come back and what the guidelines are, but then you throw in, you know, just a couple of weeks before, or even maybe after you finalize those, your, your stages and your plan, you know, how to adjust on the fly or pivot, you know, quickly. I mean, it's difficult enough to prepare and bring students back on any given year normally, and now you throw in circumstances and situations that are foreign to, to most of us in, 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 in a lot of ways. And yet, uh, you know, kudos to you guys for being able to pivot and, and, and have that, you know, the, the, the foresight to, uh, you know, be able to pivot and have that contingency plan in place as well. Um, hey, hey, Ben. <clears throat> Sorry, Ben. I'd love to hear what you're seeing uh, on your end. I know you got a big webinar coming up on Wednesday, I believe, a two-day two -day webinar. How are you guys, like, the thing that I, I have a five-year-old, my big concern is she's going to the kindergarten right now. I would think there would be a different <clears throat> track for her versus, you know, someone that's in high school and someone that's in, you know, college. But what do you guys see when you're in? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's fundamentally different tracks for higher education than there is for, we'll call it K-12 at this point. But I think we're seeing a dynamic shift. Um, unfortunately, uh, not by option, more by necessity right now. And so we see people that are panicking um, in regards to online delivery of online teaching and online learning. And then you compound that with how am I going to have the hardware or how am I going to set this up if I have half the class remote, half the class in person. So we're, we're really trying to elevate this and make this as easy as possible. And one of the turnkey solutions obviously is the D10 and the me 
but also we want to make sure that we're helping to say, how do I take my in-person content and how do I make that applicable to people that are online? We understand that, that right now the teaching community is doing a lot of things out of the norm and we applaud that. We, we are certainly understanding that you guys are one of the linchpins right now of kind of holding everything together from an educational purpose. And what we're hoping is, is as we kind of come out of this is that we can maybe evolve education fundamentally so that we have excellence and equity across the globe or across the United States or, or wherever you may be based right now. We do understand that there's limited resources in some places, but in doing some of these options and in being prepared for what we're going through now, it's gonna really help us elevate the ability to educate in a more fundamental way that can be accessible to, to millions more people. Yeah, it's definitely evolving right now. And, you know, we talked a lot about yesterday about just, you know, everyone's got a different sort of plan in mind and how do we, we're creating a new, new normal. And I just would love to see like, for Mitch, maybe start with Mitch, what does the new normal look like to you? I mean, if you pivot, are you gonna be preparing for this for next year, for the future? Will COVID-19 be around? Will there be another, you know, virus or a different way? How is this gonna shift the entire sort of education landscape, if you will? That's a great question. And I think one of the, the pivots um, that we've had to make is to have the ability to pivot. And, and so I think that's the, the, first, the first major change is, is this idea of flexibility. Um, as evidenced in California. So my reality is different than Paul's reality and it might be different than re the reality of some educators who are on this call is that we all face state, local, national, whatever uh, mandates that we face. So I think the first thing is, is being able to be flexible. Two is I think developing a pedagogy that is, is for learning and, and utilizing the tools that we have in place that's just good solid teaching and learning. And one of the things I think we all experienced in the spring, I know we did here, is in the emergency remote learning, it highlighted some of the areas that were, that were weaknesses within, within our, our curriculum and in our, our delivery models and within our technology, quite frankly. And so when teachers were, were stuck at home, stuck behind just their computer, you had camera quality issues, you had sound quality issues, you might even have had internet connectivity issues. And so um, trying to gain control of those, providing the technology that allows our teachers to, to be creative, to provide the best possible teaching and learning environment they can in as natural of an environment as possible, right? And I think that's one of the things I'm certain we'll talk about here in a little bit is just the, the angle of the camera, the quality of the microphones, all of those things, when, when those variables are removed, you, you create an environment that can be more natural. So I think what's in the future is that, I, I, I mean, we all hope there's a, there's a cure, um, a vaccine or something for COVID. I, I don't know that that actually is the end story here. Even if we get that, I think education has fundamentally been altered in how we access and what we think about accessing and delivering. So that would be my, my short answer. Yeah, yeah and yeah. I, I just, I want to add Paul to this too. One of the things that comes up with me is we, we talked about this before together uh, during the cycle that we were going through, but there's some teachers that are more receptive and more technologically savvy, Paul, and some that are less. How are you bridging that gap? Are you guys doing training programs? Are you teaching them? how to use Zoom and D10, what does that look like? And, and you know, what is the resistance to it? So yeah, you, you bet. Professional development is key and we are looking at more and more ways of doing it. And um, it's, 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 you know, it, it really comes down to a comfortable teacher does a much better job delivering content than a teacher who is nervous and afraid of the, of the technology. Um, it, it, it's amazing that, you know, both the D10 and Zoom's Simplicity is one of the things that have made it successful, and I have said several times that you know Zoom saved saved the state of Ohio, in my opinion, um, because I don't know what we would have done if we would have tried to go another route. But as we start looking at you know it, you know even the, the new normal, it's not going to go away. Uh, we bought Zoom Pro licenses for all of our teaching staff. We were planning on redoing it again if, if things blew over in the summer uh, because of what a, what a powerful tool it is. Even for a student, as we're looking at our hybrid scenario of these double classrooms, some of those students are gonna be pretty darn far away from the board when, when, when we're in that scenario. But they have a Chromebook and they could pull up Zoom and you know, our teacher can use Zoom as a way to be able to make that content come to their desktop. As we start to look at our students in general too, 
students who are going to be men who are medically fragile, being able to have them be able to connect from a hospital or connect from home with their with their classmates is 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 huge for them. Gives them that extra boost. We also have some students that you know emotionally can't really handle some their classroom environments or yeah. can't handle the the Zoom conference environment, the recording of our of our lessons and making that curriculum still available for them are going to be important pieces for them and for them to be able to still be able to stay in touch with the content. We can pull them out of the classroom, but we can't pull them away from the curriculum. We need to make those pieces available for them. But even the recording piece is important for the parents who want to help their children. My son's a senior and I'm terrible at math. And so me trying to help him is more than a challenge, it's an embarrassment. So if I can maybe pull some things out of there and figure out why they're doing it this way, I can help, I can help him. Or he has a project that we're looking at, you know, he's, he's, his version, it may not be the same version of how it's delivered, uh, being able to be able to pull those pieces together, go, no, 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 you're missing this, this, and this, we need to get those pieces in. So as a parent, I also appreciate those part, those parts as well. So that's where I kind of see that new normal going. And, and but but for the teachers, it is just so important that they just get comfortable with it. And okay. these two models make it possible. I think a lot of us are in the same boat. You know, trying to figure out really what to do daily with with our our kids, regardless of the grade or what level. Yeah, it could be trying certainly now. And it's not just the education point, but it is the mental health, everything else that you just spoke of. I mean, we have to take those into consideration and. You may have 100 students that are remote for a variety of reasons, and they will be, there'll be 100 different reasons why. And so still being able to deliver content to, you know, get them, you know, let them feel, you know, even though they are remote, let them feel like they're part of the classroom and being able to see their, their you know, their, their classmates, be able to collaborate and, you know, re regardless of where they are physically located, still being able to use the tools available to them and, and really get a better experience um, and, and enable them to stay engaged and not just third party curriculum, read the materials, take a test and you're done. I mean, really true collaboration is kind of what I think we're all striving for. So Mitch, let's, let's back up just a little bit and think about, so, you know, when you were started your initial plan for the fall semester, you know, when looking for, you know, video conferencing or whiteboard or, or just tech in general, uh, you know, what, what were those options and what requirements did you have as you made your decision? Yeah, it's a great question. I think a lot of <clears throat> a lot of folks were, um, as we came out of that emergency remote, um, trying to figure out how do we um, how do we I, I say how do we improve the experience um, for all users, um, especially those delivering the content um, for kids. And and so a couple of the things that were high on our list was high quality camera. Um, it had to have it had to have a wonderful camera, um, and it had to have a range of view that would allow us to to see as much of the classroom, if not all of the classroom at one time without having multiple cameras, without having um, uh, a strange setup. Uh, the next thing is it had to have excellent microphones. Um, it had to be something where you could hear. And so I had early on heard of some schools were talking about having a kid stand up in front of a classroom and hold an iPad. And, and that's how they would do Zoom. And I'm not exaggerating. That was the level of, of problem solving solutions that we had. And, and the camera is not built for that. The microphone is not built for that. It just it was an inadequate solution. Um, I heard some schools suggesting turning the teacher desktop around. That's not going to work. Um, there's other solutions on the market. Um, I won't um, mention them here, but there, there are lots. We looked at all of them. And really what it came down to is, is finding something that had the ability to have a great camera, have great microphones that we didn't have to build ourselves. And, and we, it turned out that also had, we added to, it wasn't our initial list, but add to it a solid display that allowed for some excellent um, opportunities for potential whiteboarding and or um, collaboration and sharing. And it, 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 for us, the D10 came together with all of those solutions in one, but I would say that was kind of our, our list. Um, and and we, we were everywhere from trying to build it ourselves, going out and buying individual parts um, to, to looking for a full scale solution. And, and thankfully, I, we're thankful we landed with this one. That's great. Hey, Mitch, yeah. can you just collaborate, just add to that? What was it like, you got your box, can you tell, to tell the audience what it was like to get the box and then to get it set up? What was that like? Easy, hard, just the whole process. Yeah, I mean, I think watching our, our IT folks set it up, I, I personally did not set it up, so I will confess, I don't know. 
but watching them set it up, it did not seem hard. Um, and uh, it, it, the ease of use, I think, was really pretty simple. And, in, and we ta we've talked here, we, we're using them in almost every location we have. We're using them in a, in a dual display um, situation. So we use the HDMI output um, on the D10 to a passive display, which for us is most often a, a large screen TV, 55 inches or bigger. And so um, in a classroom, we've got two. In fact, I probably could actually just do this for a quick second. Um, we have two. I've got them set up right behind me. Um, much like that That's in great. all the rooms. And it's very simple setup. I think our folks have found that it's pretty easy. Um, and even once you get the connection to the Zoom rooms, it, it, it goes really, really smoothly. And how about you, Paul? Same thing? Yeah, I'm going to have to say the hardest part was getting it out of the darn box. I mean, and that's <laughs> because we were box challenged. I yeah. mean, it was, it was uh, it, very, very simple to, to get out, get set up, put together. Um, not a, I mean, we were really happy with uh, how quickly we were able to just get that up and rolling and, and, and rolling into classrooms. We were actually doing it prior to COVID. And we, for us, it was a tool for us to bring virtual field trips or, dis, or uh, distance learning lessons to classrooms. Um, so for our teachers, that's kind of how they were first looking at it. Um, with that recent experience with just you know, our teachers going, wow, that was easy. It made us feel much more comfortable for us to have our first mobile teacher who was actually a teacher in our building who was instructing two students at one of our local community colleges who was not very technology savvy. We were thrilled that we were able to put that together, put it in her hands, and she immediately just took to it like a duck on water. She felt very comfortable. She said, oh, so this is my whiteboard. Okay, that works. Uh, so, so they can see me, they can hear me. Okay, that works. Uh, all of those pieces were things that just really just made it a smart decision for us to continually move forward. Yeah, that's, yeah that's, that, that's great to hear, you know, especially, you know, back in slide three, I talk about simple, simple, simple. And I think you guys both just said simple or easy, you know, six or seven or eight times. So thank you for validating that, you know, things that we, we talk about as we kind of prepare, because it really is. I mean, we've all been in conference rooms or classrooms with, you know, uh, multiple sources, you know, multiple cables, HDMI, USB, and just trying to figure it out. And it's extremely intimidating. So you know, simple, simple, simple is, is so important, whether it's, you know, a, a less of a burden on the IT staff to deploy uh, and set up. But then, you know, yeah, duck, you took to take to a duck on water, you just said. And so you're exactly right. Fire it up. And it's just intuitive. And in and the, the workflow in terms of instruction, it, it just happens and it comes, you know, without a lot of, you know, really no work. I mean, you know, Zoom does a great job with, uh, you know, uh, in a an extensive database of knowledge base of, of tools and tips and tricks, but it really is super simple and easy to use as an all in one unit. You know, I'll, I'll continue here with with Paul, um, you know, looking about looking back at your background, you know, you've been implementing and using distance learning as you as you mentioned, you know, for 25 years now, including being the, the current uh, vice chair of the Ohio Distance Learning Association. So Think back to the early days, you know, when you first started to deploy, you know, distance learning hardware and trying to piece it all together, you know, what were those initial challenges? And then fast forward to today, you know, and I, you've hit on a lot of this already, but fast forward to today and think about just the challenge uh, and the things that you guys have to overcome from, you know, a remote, you know, scenario or situation. And then, you know, how have you guys, you know, stressed the, the ease of and starting to implement to, you know, different tools, uh, especially Zoom and, and D10 into the classroom. Wow. So going back into, back in the old, make me feel like I, yeah. an old man here. But, uh, yeah, going back to the, to the ISDN days and where we were just, you know, on a wing of a prayer that we were hoping we were going to connect, let alone, you know, have a successful connection and wondering, you know, if, if, if a lab fires up in, in the other end of the wing, am I able to maintain my call? Uh, were, were challenges that yeah. we had to go, you know, I'm so thrilled to not have to relive. Um, I mean, we, we would roll up two 32 inch televisions on giant carts into a classroom and the teacher's looking at me like, you're going to put that where? Um, and we would and those TVs <laughs> weigh, and those TVs weighs, you know, 150 pounds a piece, right? You know, and they're just <laughs> huge boxes. Exactly. And just, you know, getting that connected and then running into the network closet and making that to change my network so that I can get it on the right network so we can connect. And then to find out that we have, a, you know, that the site on the other end has a power outage. 
All right. So now we get to try and do this all again tomorrow. It'll be great. Um, night and day. It's just it's almost a crime. It's too easy um, where it's a matter of us being able to get us connecting. And many of our state uh, partners have still had legacy equipment. So Zoom's ability to have the ability for us to connect to H323 with the yeah. Cloud Connect feature was huge for us, which of course just rolls right into our Zoom rooms and our and uh, the D10. So for us, it was really works very well where we have had scenarios where teacher is on the D10, the students are still on a another brand of, of H323. Um, so those things are still able to happen. And so it, it really is a, a nice transition for us to be able to move away from those. And uh, I'm hoping not to have to pick up one of those other remotes again. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I did that intentionally just because I've experienced that. Everybody on this call has probably experienced that. And as some, you know, if you think of it, you've got 45 minutes or an hour, right, to instruct. And, and, it's, and if it doesn't work, if you have problems, whether it's with service or the hardware, or you just can't figure it out, I mean, you've lost that 45 minutes or an hour. And so you said it perfect, you know, we'll try again tomorrow and see what happens. You know, that's kind of what, you know, I've seen over the years as well. So yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, and, uh, you know, easy, easy, easy is still kind of the, the message for some of this. Um, so for both of you, Mitch and Paul, and I, again, various, uh, you know, experience in terms of, you know, class delivery with, with both products at this point. But um, Paul, how are you guys, how, how do your teachers or instructors, you know, how do you keep in, your students engaged, you know, when they're remote? So we're using a lot of extra, you know, a lot of tools um, that are, you know, obviously Zoom's poll features one, but we, a lot of our teachers though use what they're most familiar with uh, for polling of our students, but then also just the constant interaction with the students. That is the key piece. We've got to keep them engaged. If we're just going to be able to just put up a slideshow and just roll right through that thing until my class period is done, you're going to lose them even faster in a remote environment than you would in a traditional classroom environment. At least then you can hit them with a stick. Um, in this situation, but we'd never do that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, never, do that. never do that. But um, at least, I mean, you constantly need to be engaging the students. Using the breakout rooms to give them the opportunity to be collaborators is a very important piece. But also, though, as we start pulling away, and this is a key thing when our, in our spring, was if our students are all remote, them having the opportunity to even see each other is huge. Yeah. So even giving a little bit of time for the socialization to take place, to get, let the kids talk, let the kids be kids. I remember um, having a program I was doing with a bunch of preschoolers and kindergartners just to give parents a break, um, reading stories to them. We had one student who was connected on his iPad and he, was, he had a virtual background and the other kids asked him about it and he actually gave those other kids and in service of how to virtually change his background. And as I'm watch, reading my story to them and they're changing their backgrounds over and over, I went, oh, those poor teachers that I'm gonna be throwing them back to. But it's just, the kids do very well when they're engaged and when they're motivated. And those, those are key things on, on keeping them engaged in the program. Yeah. yeah, hey Ben, I'd be interested in knowing what features get used most. You know, the, is it the screen share, the desktop share, annotation, are people playing videos? Uh, with sound, what what are you seeing most? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you kind of hit the nail on the head there. I mean, the whiteboard is, is big, right? There's definitely interaction there. People love the breakout rooms. Um, people love the recordings. The other thing to kind of note, and, and Jeffrey kind of led us into this, is Zoom is obviously doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on education. And so what that means for everyone on, on this call and everyone that's using Zoom is uh, we just hired a product engineer specifically for education. We just hired product marketing specifically for education. And their two main goals are to meet with schools, to meet with educators, to find out where the gaps are, right? Where does Zoom think that this is a great feature? And the feedback is, well, that's great, but I don't use it and here's why. Or, hey, you could really save me this amount of time or this heartache if we could get this. And so we're really looking to build a, a community here and an ecosystem that helps the educational networks really drive behavior and drive, you know, education 
during this time. And we understand it's, it's not easy, um, but we want to hear and we love the feedback and, and we love keeping everyone going, right? Um, and so part of that is, is the teachers and the staff and the, and the team behind the scenes. Part of that are our partners like D10 that make this easy and scalable. And then part of that is our team that's continuing behind the scenes to really elevate this game. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, I'd love to match for you. Like there's, I, how are you like doing chemistry classes or doing like, you know, PE or, or cheer or those things that are more interactive? Is there, a, is there a plan to sort of use those Zoom features to, and then of course D10 or others to, to help you teach? And, and you're on mute, just so you know, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just listening, listening to everyone talk. I think this is probably one of the things, because <clears throat> I'm not an IT guy, I'm, I'm an educator at heart and, and, and a head of school who focused more on the, the educational process um, throughout this. And, and one of the things I think that um, for at least here that needs to be said is we talked about the ease of the IT portion, right? And getting it set up. I think there's an, another level and, and Jeff, your question really hits on that is, is really the next phase that really has to be thought of. And I think that this is something that I can't say I have answers for. I mean, I, I would be, I'd be lying and I'd be arrogant to say that I know how our teachers are going to use this. And we're going to be awesome. And we are going to be awesome. But there's a, there's a process now that, that we have to go through, which I was writing some notes while you all were talking of, 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 of a pedagogy for learning that also is exemplified by our teachers in, in how to teach and learn in this environment and how to be creative in this environment. And the longer it goes, the more it's going to highlight this need for excellent, high quality teaching and learning strategies, the same ones that we used in the classroom, whatever those learning strategies might be, how can they be adapted to this new environment? And that's going to take creativity. It's going to take um, ingenuity. Um, it, it's going to take um, us time to sort that out. But I think that if we approach this with uh, a posture of, of, of creativity of how do we figure this out, I think there's a lot of really amazing things that can be sorted in the course of time. So I'll give you an example. I showed this to you guys yesterday. It was just remarkable to watch. I was watching our, our, our high school principal who also works with our cheerleaders working with cheerleaders the other day while they were doing some um, D10 training and looking at the board and she had her whole team or most of her team up on the, the D10 board and, and, um, and she was able to, to watch them warm up. She was able to watch them go through um, synchronized jumps, which I, was remarkable to me that they could do it even, even through Zoom. They were counting, you know, um, I think they count to eight, shows my ignorance, but anyway, they were doing that and they're doing their whole process. Um, <laughs> But what was most remarkable about it, I think this is a part that just we've hit on it, but it, even I was there, I was able to interact with those girls in the cheerleading squad and the coach in real time, in, in real, in, in, and even I was joking because I, I was stretching with them. I could only touch my knee. But um, there's, a, there's a humanness that comes to this. So I think all that you've said, Jeff, is really important. I think I don't know exactly how we're going to use it in chemistry. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. But I know that we have professional teachers who have incredible teaching and learning strategies. The next phase is supporting them as they, they bring it to a new medium. And I think, that, I think that's really the key. Um, is to really focus in on, on teaching and learning now. Because I do think this is going to be with us for some time, right? I think that this very well could be the, mo the, the vast portion of this next school year where we're going to have to be sorting with this, potentially even into the future. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think some of those new products, we're going to have you guys test, as you know. I'm going to send you guys some of the goes and the mates. Those are the ones that attach to existing TVs but have the, the little handheld device, right, where students can, you know, slash, throw things to the board that you're instructing on uh, and while holding it themselves, but also the flexibility of taking your existing televisions and turning them into conferencing stuff. Um, and the 27 inch, I know you guys can't see it, but I have it on over here on the right hand side. That's going to change things too. We, I literally picked that up and take it into the garage and put it in front of my daughter in front of her piano. And it's got a 160 degree field of view. Uh, it's got high quality audio, a great camera. So the teacher is just over the moon. Like, what is that that you're using? I mean, I usually use an iPhone. I'm like, yeah, it's a 27 inch. Well, what did you do? I just picked it up, plugged it in and turned on away your go. So I was thinking like home kits maybe for chemistry or maybe this a new way of doing things, right? But I think we're going to create a whole new industry here, but also a great way of, like you said, when that camera goes on, there is interaction there. The smile, like I can see your face. I, I know what you're doing, right? So it is, it is really important to get that, that. And so to the Paul's point, that social interaction, my third grader, she's just dying to see her friends. And when the camera goes on uh, with, the, with the gallery view, she just lights up and she feels more at ease, right? And 
it is something that's really important for them. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that as well. Um, you know, and thinking about, you know, we are learning as we go. We are all in, in the same situation and, and dis developing and discovering new use cases in education daily. And, you know, the great thing about, you know, Zoom and our relationship with Zoom and then our incredible clients and, and schools and our customers, you know, we all know that we're kind of a, a family in a sense of, of trying to figure this thing out together. And so, you know, through platforms and webinars such as this, you know, we'll continue to, uh, you know, really develop those use cases and, and, and make those available. So, you know, if there's anything that, you know, one school may be doing, another school uh, could learn from and vice versa. And, you know, we'll be doing webinars, you know, monthly. Uh, so we're working on a, additional content and, and other areas to focus on, whether it's, you know, financially, you know, or financial in school or grants or other things like that. You'll see us, you know, really work, you know, tight with our, you know, of course, with, with Paula Mitch, but with many of our schools to really uh, show that we're, you know, you're not alone and we're, we're all in this together and really learning from each other as we kind of go through this entire, you know, experience and how, uh, you know, yeah, that new normal uh, for the classroom and kind of what that actually, you know, can be or is, uh, and it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, you know, a problem or something that frustrates everybody. There are ways to make this nice and clean and simple and easy to use. And I, and Mitch and, and Paul eloquently said, you know, many and used many examples of that today. So, um, yeah, I had one more question. I know we got uh, Q&A coming here quickly, but for Ben, um, Jason brings up a good point. Is there a sharing place on Zoom that you guys are sharing best practices, uh, particularly in the EDU space? Yeah, so we're actually currently building that out right now. Um, I did put the link for the, the Zoom Academy coming next week. Um, we are going to set up kind of some of those ecosystems. We're going to try and regionalize it a little bit just for time zone matters on that front. But we want to hear from the community what has worked well, what hasn't worked well, where are the challenges. Um, not everything can be as easy as, as setting up a D10 apparently, but we want to try and get to that point and make sure that we're giving access and feedback from, from the group. Awesome. I think it's a Q&A time, Jason. Is that what's next? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to our MC Jackson and uh, kind of do a summary, do a, talk through our, our giveaway, and then, of course, yeah, Q&A. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. This has been a really amazing, amazing conversation. Thank you very much for your, your time to our, our guest panelists today. And uh, we have a winner here. So thank you again for joining us today. Rithana Graves McQueen from Kent Place in New Jersey. If you're on the call right now, you just won a uh, Zoom for Home D10 Me, which is our new 27-inch personal collaboration device, which is uh, going to be amazing as a teaching tool, as a learning tool. So congratulations. Uh, we'll connect after the webinar and make sure that you get that. You'll be on the, one of the first to receive the D10 Me when it comes out um, next month. That's awesome. Congratulations. All right. Yeah, let's, uh, well, yeah, we want to talk a little bit. I know Ben just mentioned this, uh, but uh, yeah, they are having uh, really a, a fantastic and extensive, uh, you know, summer academy for education. So please register for that, attend, and there's going to be a lot of beneficial uh, content and resources there for all of our instructors. And yeah, and yeah let's just give a little bit of plug for that. What exactly is going to be involved in that? Who's going to be, who's got to be participating? There's actually a variety of people involved, uh, some from the Zoom side, some from the customer side. We're going to talk about how you can transition from a real world classroom, uh, physical being, to how do you moderate, how do you take that onto an online medium. We have inspirational uh, participants as well, talking about awesome. how you manage the well-being. Um, so there's a variety of topics that, that we obviously want to cover. And then I think, Jeffrey, as well, you had talked about this, this webinar series having some additional topics and additional things. We understand that you know, people are interested in CARES funding. People are interested in a variety of topics. So if you can send that to the D10 team, I think that would be beneficial. And we can coordinate some times on that as well. Awesome. Good stuff. Thank you. Great. All right. So we've got a couple uh, of Q&A questions that came in uh, that we didn't get a chance to answer while we we're having our discussion. And uh, we're, we're over time, but if you guys want to stick around, we're just going to answer a couple of these questions really quick. Uh, so here's one. For those schools that have clinical hands-on as part of their programs, what suggestions do you have for fulfilling the hands-on lab requirements? 
are the hands-on lab requirements remotely? It's, it's kind of a tricky question. But it's, it's an interesting question. I, can I take that one for a second? I think that um, I think that's where that pedagogical creativity is going to come in. I think that, um, for example, I, it's funny, Jeff, you asked the question about chemistry. I actually was a chemistry teacher. I'm a chemist. That's what I, what I did. I don't know if you oh. knew that. that that's what I, what I was trained in before I, I got into educational leadership. I think that it's going to require um, an, an increased creativity. I think that the, some of the ways that we did lab, some of the principles can still be taught with, with at-home materials or with other things like that. I think that there's going to be, as I mentioned earlier, um, that's where that creative approach comes in. And some of those things are about observing um, scientific principles. Some of those are about experiencing the process of just using your hands and, and doing those things. So I think that those things can be done in a variety of different ways. That's, I don't know that it can be mimicked exactly like it was in the classroom. There's not Bunsen burners at home. There's not right. those yeah. type of things. But to, to be quite frank, um, a lot of the principles of cooking are very similar to principles that are done in the science classroom. And so with some creativity, with some forethought, and with some um, uh, ways of, of changing how we do it, I think you can utilize um, technology like we have now and some ingenuity to still get those key principles across um, so the kids learn the, the, the things that they need to learn to be able to move on. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Yeah. We got another one, one time for one more, Jackson? Yeah, so here's another question that came in the chat. Um, so it's, it's really kind of a, a question about distance education in general. And it's, is the intention to have teachers at the school regardless of if the kids are in school in order to use D10? Well, I, I think it's a, a piece that could be optional. Um, as, as you're uh, looking at your bandwidth capabilities and you're looking at your resources, it all, it, I mean, it, it is something that could be uh, you know, transported to a home to be able to use for delivery. It's also, though, something that we, you know, we're working hard to make spaces available for our teachers who are, even though they're teaching to full remote students, um, those spaces available as well. So I think that uh, both of those are optional things. And, as, and, and with this new product that uh, is being rolled down the, down the line, that becomes even more possible because it's a, it's a little smaller form factor, but same capabilities right. and options. Great point. Well, thank you guys again. Uh, we're just over time. Really appreciate the time of our panelists, of our speakers, and of course of our guests today. So we'll follow up uh, with a, a recording of the webinar, follow up with some more information as well afterwards. And keep an eye out for D10. We'll be having more webinars in the future. And if you get a chance, make sure you attend the Zoom Summer Academy next week. It's gonna be a really excellent event to learn a lot more about what we're, what we're preparing for as we move towards hybrid learning in the next couple of months. Thanks, Jackson. Hey, man, Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you so Thank much. You for Thank you guys. Appreciate it.